from day one actually Channel Zero was always a very kind of a weird explosion. We got together with Phil, Xavier, Tino and Patrice. Well, Phil came over, he proposed to do something together. The thing that comes in my mind uh, right away when I think about the beginning of the band was that little rehearsal place we had. I think it was the smallest thing possible and we used to practice there like four or five times a week. I guess that's why I don't hear anything anymore. Everybody kind of felt instantly these five people could do something. I do remember the first ever show because I still have a picture, which is more beautiful. <laughs> It was fun times though, because it was a lot about practicing and getting that band known, famous, as fast as possible, you know. When you're young and you want everything, right now. It took off and I think 11 months later we signed in Germany. In one year and a half we were Channel Zero. And of course for us it was exciting because you bring a band alive and you do whatever you have to do to make it good. In 94 we signed to a big Belgium label that played against them. They took us to the next level. All of a sudden, we were playing all of Europe, uh, UK. At that time, we didn't care about anything. The only thing we wanted was to uh, become the biggest band in the universe. We struggled a lot. Even if we had a lot of great times, a lot of good moments. Inside the band there was a lot of contradiction also, where we should go, what we should do. You kind of need to get to the same door all together. We were suffering because on the financial side we took a lot of risks. We jumped a lot without a parachute. I think in 97 the contradiction was really intense to call it a day. And at the same time feeling that you might have broken that big wall when you all of a sudden it collapses and then the world becomes yours. I think we were on that edge. We toured a lot of bands like Megadeth, Danzig, Kiss. I remember the tour with Body Count. It was one of our most amazing things we ever did. At the end of that tour, you know, that magic thing that was in that band got completely out of our hands. We had again so much discussion about so many things and if we can't make it work together, how are we gonna make it work? I felt like, okay, we have to stop this because I didn't want to be in a band where people had to hit each other's face to move on. I don't believe in that. We took that long break. I did a solo band in between, which didn't really work because it was not metal. And yeah, I think in 2009, the first instance was to do a one reunion show. We did the announcement of that one reunion show. They put it on sale. We sold six shows out in one hour. They were a big part of coming back together in 2010 because that whole reunion started with a Facebook group. That's the moment where we started to check for other guitar players. The first couple of years, it was a little tough because the last guitar player was beloved by the fans. I had to come in and prove myself. It wasn't that easy. But nowadays, I have a good relationship with the fans of Channel Zero, for sure. For me, it was important that if we would do something together, that the guy who was replacing Xavier also brought not only his talent, but also his personality. I'm gonna pour uh, shots for the crowd tonight. Sold out show in Kotrick. I'm gonna get some shots. Wait till they start, right? Yeah. Hey, hey, hey. Shake it with that. You go to go. <laughs> I like how you throw me off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, come on. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> you should just threw me in the crowd. Oh, yeah. No.
They named their dog after me. Hi, Mikey. <laughs> I got a call from a friend of mine. He told me about this band needing a guitar player. He got me a tryout, so I got a backpack and a guitar and flew around the world. I got out of the car from the airport and I saw Frankie. We didn't even have the chance to tell him you're the one. He decided he was the one. <laughs> Fire! You look good with hair. Yeah, I do. <laughs> I look like him, look. Hey, it's my twin. Hey, I'm Mikey Dolan. It's like my dad. <laughs> I said the most cocky thing ever. I was like, hey man, your search is over. Yes, yes. And he went, yeah, well, maybe you should plug in first. <laughs> but it worked out. But it worked. When I was a kid, I was a metal fan. When I was like 21 years old, I had a thrash metal band. And then I went to Snot, and it was way more loose and punk rock. After Snot, I went to Soulfly, and all that metal stuff from the past came in handy. This band is more metal as well, and more rock, so it just fit perfect. I didn't feel any pressure. I felt really comfortable with Channel Zero immediately. I mean, there was some pressure because I became the songwriter. We were also looking for somebody who came in and plugged this guitar and straight up, bam. And that's what we were looking for because we tried a lot of guitar players and for one reason or the other, it was always a little difficult. And it just clicked. It was awesome. It was perfect. One practice and it was, okay, we're good. It's him. The first record, I really didn't quite know the direction channel should be going in or what the fans wanted because I didn't know the fan base yet. Then I did that first record and I figured it out. And then I did a second record, Kill All Kings. I think that record really hit the mark. Mikey is a writing machine. <laughs> in the beginning when he started writing a song, I thought he was like cheating. I said he must have been half of the song somewhere. <laughs> when we write these songs, we make them happen, and all of a sudden, the album is there. This last record, Exit Humanity, I think I fucking nailed it. I'm really stoked on it. Love you all! Cheers! When Phil passed away, we were again totally going for it and then of course Phil was like main icon rock in, in the whole thing his vibe his ambience the way how he was was actually so important Phil was irreplaceable still is actually it was very complicated to see what we were going to do at that time we were all comforted with something that we couldn't really explain why he was so good yesterday and now he's, he's, he's not there anymore. Nobody knew what we were going to do. A couple of months later, Roy Mayorga, a good friend of Mikey, he says, look, if you still want to do that album, we can do this. I can do this. Roy is, of course, an extremely talented drummer. We actually wanted to bring that album alive, which was prepared with Phil. So Roy listened to what Phil did in pre-demo. The first moment when we saw Phil's dad and his mom, and his brother, the first thing they were saying to us, like, look, please don't stop, because I'm sure Phil wouldn't have wanted that. so long and we've been fans of each other for so long and friends for so long. That aspect of it was initially what brought me to the band in the first place. I think it was harder for the band base than it was for me because the original drummer Phil, he was a really big personality and a very integral part of the band. The fact that he passed so unexpectedly, a lot of people probably figured that they wouldn't continue as a band. We were like a machine already, hadn't even played together. The fans were pretty sure that whoever Frankie Tino and Mikey got was going to be able to play. <coughs> it's more of like, well, would I fit in with the vibe of the band, the family style, the atmosphere that the band had? Seven is a machine. You can rely on him, it just worked with Seven right away. Seven is also somebody with an explicit vibe. On stage he's, he's so amazing. 
So we couldn't let the thought go that we might not try it. You know, Phil was Phil. Phil was is always there. How many times, even in regular week, day times, that he still passes through your mind because he was such a funny guy. I mean, I still hear his laughter because Phil was known for his... Oh, 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 oh. He's always in our hearts and he will always be in our hearts, so... Can't steal the information from me What should we do with this fucking situation? After the initial shock of like seeing somebody else behind the kit with them, everybody's super supportive and everybody loves it now. The organized chaos has always been there. It's hard to explain why. Sometimes I wish I didn't even know that word, but it's the thing that is with that band, in that band. You learn to live with that. And I think even now in 2017, 2018, maybe we're a little older and we think, reflect more on a lot of stuff. We've had so many good moments, bad moments, very intense moments. Of course we're not perfect. I don't think perfect doesn't exist, but on the other side you always try to bring something where people enjoy it live. It's also the fun though. It's fun to play with those guys. There's no stress. You get on stage to have a good time. If you're gonna have a good time, fans or people that are coming to see you are going to have a good time also. We're Channel Zero. That's what we do. We're always trying to bring it to the maximum. You always try to do your best and that's the most important thing. So performing now for me is um, trying to find absolution. stage is seeing if I can still feel the crowd, if the crowd feels me, what we're doing with the band. I'm like the connection between the band and the crowd, so what occupies me most is everybody having a great time. That's where we get the energy out of it. We suck it out of ourselves. been doing it for so long that it just feels natural. It's like eating, breathing, and walking for me. It's just being on stage is a part of my life. I think not being on stage is the hard part. When I have months off from playing music, I start to go a little bit crazy. It's easy to be on stage. I love studio work. I like recording and I love the whole creative process of that. But for me, it's all about live. That's what keeps me still doing everything. That's the payoff. When you're first starting out, you have all these expectations. If I were to go back now and talk to myself when I was 20, I'd just be like, don't sweat the small shit as much and just concentrate on, on being in the moment more. When I'm playing the shows now and the room is full, I'm blown away and I'm extremely grateful to be here. 30 years later, rock and roll, I still love it. Actually, I think I love it even more now. Getting older, musicians, they start thinking about their future. Yeah. <laughs> We do have that wonderful chance to have those people that are super loyal. Some of them we know almost from the beginning, and they're there and they still come back. Without those people... Uh... I mean, it's cliche to say it, but they're the best. <laughs> they really are the best, though. They've been with this band for 25 years. They're still here. I see photos of these same fans, young, long hair, and I see them showing up now, older, gray hair, with their kids. We just played 10 shows in the country of Belgium, sold out gigs. Those fans, they show up and they support. We really, really appreciate it. We're so dedicated to all these people that keep believing us. We're very grateful for that. on a level and you can actually afford and facilitate having a crew, it just makes our job so much easier. I just have to get on stage, 
perform, do my job. You can't just have anybody. You kind of have to have reliable, professional, knowledgeable crew guys. We're lucky. I have Charles, the kid, and he's amazing. He knows my kit better than I do, so. <laughs> Back in the 90s, I always thought that we would never <laughs> do this at this age. <laughs> Funny enough, we're still doing it. There's a bond, there's something that's very, very strong. Well, Tino has been there from day one in 1990 when we started. It's half my life, or more than half my life. I, I, I think you can call it like a, uh, it's, it's like a brother. Without him, I don't think I could do this. Being able to see how me and Frankie are, how me and Tino are, it's really natural and we're all kind of older and we've all kind of been there and done that and there's like less bullshit. <laughs> we're getting out here and just doing it because we love music and we love playing music with each other. There's chemistry. You're really lucky as a musician and a rock artist to find chemistry with other musicians and artists. And I got lucky, man. I didn't even know these guys. I came out and tried for the band. And the day I met them, it was as if we were playing together for years. Right? It's true, it's true. It has been automatic, whether it was with Mikey or with Seven also. All of a sudden, we were a band again. And that's what we were looking yeah. for. Music doesn't stand still, it moves constantly. I hope we still mean something with what we're trying to do. That's one of the main goals. We can still try to move on or make an evolution in what we're doing. Exit Humanity is something between me and Mikey, where Mikey is keeping that flag up. I think the band is still fighting to do something good. Full circle